Well, it certainly is reveal season for the next Legends expansion, Moons of Elsewhere. And some more cards have been revealed since I have done my reveal. I wanted to do like a mini review for the cards that had been revealed. There have been, uh, as of filming this, three additional cards. And I'm actually going to say three and a half because we did get to see a dragon, Kelgrantid, that was in the Bethesda article, but at the time we couldn't see what Halls of Colossus did. Then that was revealed on Twitter, so we're actually going to start with that. And Kelgrantid, if you don't remember, was the 8-9 unique willpower dragon that costs 12. It has guard, and when it comes into play, you summon Halls of Colossus. Now, what does Halls of Colossus do? Halls of Colossus, we now know, is a unique support. The only way that it can enter play is through Kale Grunteed, so you can't run like additional copies in your deck. And it says activate, summon a non-unique dragon of your choice from your deck. Now this is obviously incredibly powerful, and while the unique dragons are the showstoppers, if you will, your Odavings, your Parthenax, etc., there are some pretty good non-unique dragons that exist. So I do think that this card will eventually see some play. I don't know if it's going to end up being like a meta breaker, but where I think it fits the best is in a late game controlling version of uh, something like a Redoran Ramp Dragon deck. Specifically Redoran because I think that your non-unique dragons that you want to take the most advantage of reside in that color set. Things like Skeletal Dragon are very powerful. Uh, maybe you want to use Wildfire Dragon if you need, uh, like, additional board removal. The 5-5 five five Charging Dragon is also not unique, and that's a very powerful card to pair with your 8-9 Guard. Going a step further, you've got uh, even just, like, the Ramp Dragon is not terrible off of Halls of Colossus. You've got Undying Dragon, so uh, I think Redoran is the best home for this, ultimately. Now, you could maybe also see it in something like, uh, you know, Halalu or uh, maybe like an Ebonheart, just because Shearpoint is a decent dragon to pull. Obviously, the other cards that get revealed in this set are going to drastically impact this assessment. Uh, there is one dragon later in the video that has been revealed, and it is a non-unique, so I will talk about that when we get there. Um, so there is a chance that we might see even Intelligence pop up but really, until we see the full set, it's hard to exactly gauge, but based on the card pool, the card quality that we know about, I think Redoran ends up being you know, your best home, your best fit for something like this. Uh, why? Well, if I'm being honest, this card is very comparable in power level to something like Sotha Sil, because Sotha Sil, you're essentially going to be paying 12 to get uh, two 8-8s, one of them with guard, and it's the kind of card that has to... Uh, be answered like in multiples. Unless you have a Dawn's Wrath or something, you typically have to answer the 8-8 so the Sill creates, and you have to have some sort of answer for so the Sill. Uh, Kale Grantid is in that same boat. You get a big bodied guard, in this case it's an 8-9 instead of an 8-8. It's got to be answered. And then you get the Hulls of Colossus, which has three uses, so they will likely want to have some sort of support removal or else they're going to have to deal with you know, multiple dragons coming, and they're going to have to deal with whatever dragon you went and fetched. So it, it is one of those 12 drops that's going to create uh, essentially multiple threats, if you will, that have to be answered, have to be dealt with, and in that respect, it's very powerful. But the drawback is, is in order to make this work, you have to run a, a semi-decent or a semi-healthy number of non-unique dragons, and the reality is you probably have to run them in multiples, because you don't want to be in a situation where you're playing Kelgrantid just to be an 8-9 guard. <laughs> like, that is that is like playing Wilds Incarnate, but way, way worse. Wilds Incarnate, when you don't get to draw, is still a 7 cost 5, 6 guard. But if you're paying 12 for an 8-9 guard, that is not a good time. You really need Hulls of Colossus to get you value. And where you get your uh, best value is when you're using it as a toolbox, in my mind. It is your choice. It is a tutor. So having multiple options in your deck so that you can get the right dragon at the right time is important, but that also means you have to run these non-unique dragons and have them not clog up your hand, and obviously the more powerful ones cost more, so you're going to have a lot of cards in your top end. Uh, that's why ultimately I think whatever deck this is in is going to be paired with Endurance, so you're talking about, uh, like I said, Redoran, 
Um, you know, I said Ebon Hurt earlier, but Ebon Hurt uh, was a mistake. I meant Empire. Uh, Empire and uh, maybe even Tribunal, something like that. Uh, the, the sorts of things where Halalu uh, doesn't really have ramp, but you can kind of cheat things with agility. You, you're going to want to be able to compensate for having so many expensive cards. So uh, I do think that's ultimately where it's going to be. And uh, yeah, that's that's it for now. We'll We'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the other dragon that's in this video. And this is one of those cards that you kind of keep in the back of your mind as more reveals come through because... Uh, obviously, this set is uh, going to have a pretty decent, pretty heavy dragon theme because it's based on the Elder Scrolls Online event that's currently going on that's also very dragon-centric. So uh, this, in many ways, is like Heroes of Skyrim 2.0. We're going to have a bunch of dragons. All right. Next up, we have Rimen Siege Weapons. This is a three-cost support in strength. And it says, at the start of your turn, each friendly creature deals one damage to your opponent. This is a very interesting card. The immediate thing you do is you say to yourself, what are crazy pilfer effects that I want to abuse? Because that's exactly what this card does, is it is a pilfer enabler. It's the kind of card that makes your pilfer effects go on steroids. But it has, in many ways, the same problem that Pilfer cards have, which is you gotta wait a turn. You know, outside of playing like Crossbow and Pinging Face or doing a couple of the cheeky things with like Archer's Gambit, uh, and it is worth noting this isn't strength, so you can still run those effects if really uh, that's, you know, the sort of thing you wanna do, but you still have to play this and then wait until the start of your next turn. It is just like Pilfer in that respect, and uh, it is a support, so. Sometimes they're not going to have the support removal, and that's great, but support removal has been pretty plentiful historically in this game, so uh, that's a risk. That's a, you, you pay three, you do nothing, and you might get rewards, and then even still, it's not like, it's not like some other supports that you can get an immediate value out of, like, at least with Divine Fervor, you can play it and then attack with the boosted creatures, at least with... Uh, market, you can play it and potentially play some uh, zero costs immediately. This one is very strictly a you pay three magicka, you do nothing. You also have to have at least one uh, relevant creature on the board and then hope for something. Now, obviously, this does not require pilfer creatures, like any creature deals the damage, so uh, it will also boost up empower effects. That's another thing to take into account. And it will also, you know, just represent extra damage every turn. This is the sort of thing that could be sneaky good in a deck like Token Crusader because it is so cheap. What I mean by that is, is that, you know, Divine Fervor is a fantastic value in a deck like Token Crusader because uh, you get a bunch of bonus damage and you can make value trades, but it costs five. This costing three in theory, right now, I understand that I'm talking about like the nuts opening, but in theory, if you're on uh, the Ring of Magicka, your first turn could be like, you know, Marked Man Scouting Patrol into, you know, Ring Ripping Siege Weapons, and then the next turn you're you're getting like four bonus damage, right? That's, that's nothing to laugh at. Um, if you're, again, going the Archer route, if you're really trying to do like a Pilfer Archer list that... Um, also maybe wants to run Gambit or Crossbows to be extra cheeky. Worth noting that uh, you could run this with Thieves' Den, and then all of your creatures start to represent real imminent threats very, very quickly. Now again, you're stacking some supports, but that is, that is, you know, a potential fun deck. I don't know if it's going to be good, right? But it's going to be fun. Uh, something like Halalu running Siege Weapons and Thieves' Den and like Master of Thieves on top of it and then just a bunch of go wide and like redraw your hand strategies. So I don't think like traditional aggro Halalu, but more like a combo centric one, uh, this could see play. I just, I don't know. This one, this one is very interesting to me and it's I think one of the harder ones to judge because it could go either way. On paper, it looks like it's very answerable. It does not look like it's the sort of card that you're going to get that immediate value from, and as such, I'm skeptical. 
But if we get some very powerful Pilfer cards coming in the set, and we know the set, besides being Dragon-centric, is also very Khajiit-centric. Uh, it's already been confirmed we're going to get, you know, Khajiit in every attribute color. We're going to get Pilfer showing up pretty frequently. So this is the sort of card that could end up actually being a sleeper hit. It's just, uh, again, based on what we know right now, without having seen the entire set, uh, I'm skeptical. I can see the top end. It certainly has a high ceiling. It's just also very answerable. All right, now that I've beat that horse to death, uh, let's move on. Uh, the next card is uh, Dromathra Reaper. I'm slaughtering that. I never know how, when I, when I see a Khajiit name, I never know how to pronounce it until I hear it. So until further notice, uh, this is uh, Dro Mothra, because I, Godzilla reasons, Reaper, or just a Mothra Reaper, or just Reaper for short. Anyway, uh, this is a two cost endurance creature. It is a three, two on summon, consume a creature. Now, again, if you're not up to speed, consume means you uh, banish a card in your own discard pile. So on summon, you can consume a creature in your discard pile by banishing it. When a creature leaves your discard pile, Reaper gains plus zero, plus one, and you gain one health. So this is potentially a two cost, three, three, gain one life when it enters play. And it can continue to gain health if you either play other consume effects yeah, it's also whenever a creature leaves your discard pile, so reanimation effects where you're bringing things back with Necromancer or maybe Defiler will also trigger it. If somebody else banishes your discard pile with like a memory race, it would trigger this. If you play something like Journey to Sovngarde, then this thing will go through the roof in health. In fact, uh, one of the things that I know Justin Larson would do if he was still around... Oh, sometimes I miss you, Justin. Uh, high Hrothgar decks have always been a pet thing of his. Uh, this is the kind of creature that can go from 2 health to like 15 or 20 very quickly, uh, especially with Journey. And so playing something like uh, High Hrothgar and then, you know, having one of these on the board and playing Journey and swinging for like an OTK just seems hilarious, right? Is it going to be reliable? Is it going to be competitive? No, but will it be fun? Will there be people who do it for the memes? Absolutely. Now, in terms of actual like viability, I think this card is relevant. Uh, a 3, 2 for 2 is not terrible. Even if you do nothing else, it's not terrible. It's not the end of the world. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Trades into Barrow Stalker. That's, you know, like bare minimum in my mind. <laughs> Are you on to Magicka? Likely going to be getting a 3-3 body very often? Probably not. Now, if you are running something like Spellsword Tokens, for example, and you've played a Marked Man early, maybe you've played a Scouting Patrol early, uh, when those creatures die, they'll go to the discard pile, and then you could play this to follow it up, consume them, and yeah, you could get it very early. It's entirely possible. Um, Scout, you could play something like the... Uh, scouts report and discard a creature into your discard pile and then turn around and play this on turn two and it would be a 3-3 three, three in that regard. So there are some tricks without even seeing the rest of the set to pulling that off. But the reality is like you're not going to ring this out and get amazing value. So that's an interesting thing. There's a lot of mechanics in this set that, uh, you know, between stuff like this and the wax and wane mechanic, it seems like they're really trying to make you decide between using the Ring of Magicka for tempo or saving for future value. And I really, really like that design. A long, long time ago, when I used to do this video series called The Forge, um, I did a series of cards that had prophecy, but if you played them on your turn, also did additional effects so that whenever you triggered a prophecy, then the player had that decision to make of do I take the prophecy value now or do I put the card into my hand because I need greater value later. I love it when you present players with meaningful decisions because anytime they're making those decisions, that's a place where, uh, you know, skill can shine. 
And this and the wax and wane mechanic are like in that vein, so I'm a big fan of them. I think this card will end up seeing play. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, ubiquitous by any means. It's also going to depend on how many other effects care about consume, because if we get things that, you know, trigger every time you consume something, then obviously getting a critical mass of consume effects would matter. This is, this is good enough to see play in some regard without seeing the rest of the set and has the potential to be bonkers if we get a lot of consume synergy. So keep an eye out for this card. Um, you know, quality quality stats in Endurance have seen play since the dawn of time, right? Your Young Mammoths, your Bleak Coast Trolls, this is potentially a 3-3 three, three for 2. You know, Dragon Tail Savior was very similar to that, and that has seen play off and on for a long time, so look out. All right, last up we have Glacial Dragon. This is a card that was revealed by Dragon Tamer Blade. This is a 6 cost intelligence creature. It is a 4-5. It says, Shackle enemy creatures damaged by friendly dragons. And then on summon, deal 2 damage to a creature. Now, the obvious <laughs> comparison here is Icy Shambles. It's very, very similar. You know, it's... Stat line is similar. Its effect is similar. However... This is entirely relevant for a number of other reasons. So Shambles was like a direct upgrade to Ash Servant with literally the only drawback being that it died to uh, Dawnbreaker and Ash Servant didn't. Outside of that, it was just kind of straight power creep. Uh, Glacial Dragon here has the synergy thing working for it because it is a dragon. There's a lot of cards that care about dragons. We're about to get likely a whole bunch more with this set. Uh, you know, earlier we were talking about Halls of Colossus. This is a fine card to go fetch because in terms of having dragons that provide you utility in, in a toolbox, like I was mentioning earlier, um, getting additional bodies on the board and then also shackling something while also playing a guard is a very defensive move. So if you're playing Tribunal, Dragon, Ramp or something, and you play that Kalgranteed into fetching a Glacial, uh, you can... You can lock down a board pretty hard with a play like that at that stage in the game. That's a big, like, stall move. It can really slow down the tempo of the game. Now, it is also worth noting that, unlike Shambles, this is Shackle enemy creatures damaged by friendly dragons. So this means anytime your dragons attack into things, they'll still be shackled. So if you're, you know, trying to slow things down in that regard, maybe they have a huge creature and your dragon isn't big enough to kill it. Uh, they can still damage it by attacking into it in Shackle. You can also play fun effects, for example, like uh, Tiny Dragon or Wildfire Dragon, and they'll deal damage to creatures and then Shackle them if this is in play. So you can get some real value out of those. Um, again, as far as like the whole like smaller dragons that might want to just attack into something and die to Shackle it, uh, Reflective Automaton still fits that bill. So that's relevant. And, you know, Odaving normally clears the board, but if you're in some weird control mirror where there's a lot of big bodies on the board, I mean, that, that still will get the job done. So uh, Glacial Dragon has a bit more utility. The fact that it is also a dragon means it will trigger, um, you know, your scouts. So you can draw cards with it, gain life with it, etc., etc. Is it good enough to see play? This one is... Uh, again, very, very hard to judge without seeing the rest of the set. Um, I, I know that some people will for sure play it, even if it's just in some sort of like tribal for fun deck. Like whether or not it's competitive is a different story. But I mean, this will see play because people will want to try out dragons, right? Like everybody loves dragons. I love dragons. You love dragons. If you're trying to tell me right now as you're watching this video, no charm, I don't like dragons. You're just lying to yourself. Everybody likes dragons. The, the creatures that get eaten by dragons for lunch are like, well, at least I got eaten by a dragon. You know what I mean? Dragons are awesome. So will this card see play? Absolutely. Will it be competitively viable? That's going to largely depend on the dragon package that gets introduced in this set. And we, we won't know until we see the rest. Uh, I can see the bones of something being playable in this because it's, uh, you know, 
its stat line doesn't blow me away, but the effect is a very good utility effect, and it is an enabler for a bunch of other effects with other dragons. Like I said, Glacial Dragon into a Tiny Dragon to lock down a lane is a pretty big deal. Uh, fetching this with Hulls of Colossus, uh, potentially a very, very big stall move. So uh, I like the potential in this, but we got to see the rest of the cards before we can pass a final verdict. Uh, and that's it for the cards that have been revealed thus far. So as always, if you're watching this, leave some comments. Let me know what you're excited for. Even if I don't respond, I do read them all. You know, are there... Uh, decks that you can't wait to try just based on these cards alone? Are there, you know, more stuff that you're excited for? Do you want to see more Khajiit? Do you want to see more dragons? The answer is both, because who doesn't like cats and who doesn't like dragons, right? Like, this thematically might be the best set that Legends could ever get. It's cats and dragons, man. I, I don't know what else to say. So, uh, anyway, I love you all. Thanks for watching, and until next time, may you walk on warm sands.